boy, am I impressed with the RCA group here. You were uh, we're covering the, the full spectrum. <laughs> we're going from ULF to millimeter waves. And I'm going to take you back to HF and ULF here for a few minutes. And I think you'll enjoy this. First, a couple of quick notes. Um, unfortunately, I'm on the tail end of a head cold. So my voice is a little bit raspy. So you won't get my smooth radio voice on this presentation. Sorry about that. And secondly, this is an engineering presentation on HARP. I'm the electrical engineer, the RF designer, responsible for the hardware up there. So any plasma physics questions that you might have, I won't be able to answer those. We have a lot of plasma physics experts that could certainly answer those questions for you. But uh, we got a lot of ground to cover here. <clears throat> and, uh, and my goal here is to give you a good idea of why HARP was built, why it was built, where it was built, um, how we designed it, how we assembled it, how we operate it, and a quick look at some of the science that is done at HARP. Okay, let's get started. HARP was actually designed by a very small group of really smart folks. And this is the uh, list here. And um, obviously, I'm number three on the list here. Let's see, where's is the pointer on the side or... Whoops. There we go. Thank you. So I'm number three on the list. I guess that's a pretty good rank. Okay. So HARP. HARP is the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. And it's a joint program that was funded by the Air Force, the Navy, and DARPA. And it's currently operated by the University of Alaska in, um, out of Fairbanks. They have the Geophysical Institute up there, and they're running the site now. It's very active, by the way. So radio science research in Alaska. Let's go north to Alaska. Why is HARP important? Why should we be interested in HARP? Well, HARP is the United States only state-of-the-art radio science research facility with premier technical capability from ELF through microwave frequencies, including radar and optical light experimentation. When people think about HARP, they think about only one instrument, our largest instrument, the big HF transmit array, and we'll spend time on that. But the site is very big and it has capability from DC to light. A unique high power HF transmitting system, which we call the um, ionosphere research instrument, the IRI, is capable of temporary ionosphere modification for radio science research to do cause and effect studies. Comprehensive diagnostic instrumentation on site, including magnetometers, rheometers, radar imaging devices, incoherent scatter radars, for example, are there many receivers, ionospheric sounders, satellite receivers, general purpose receivers, arbitrary waveform generation, reception for digital modes. We pretty much can do it all. It's a very large, very capable site. Receiving diagnostic instruments at the site are typically run 24-7, 365, collecting valuable long-term observations of the electromagnetic spe uh, spectrum. This, these, this history that we can collect is very, very valuable. The facility is located in a region where the auroral oval and the mid-latitude ionosphere are easily within view, meaning within the pointing angle of our HF transmitting beam. So this is an optimum location for most radio experimentation involving the ionosphere. And of course, the remote location in Alaska provides a wealth of research opportunities with low man-made electromagnetic noise and the very low probability of causing HF radio interference to any service because we're an NVIS or vertically beaming HF site. Okay, let's talk briefly about the history of HARP. This is a pretty busy view graph, and I'm just going to sort of just give you the highlights of this view graph. In 1990, through a congressional funding initiative, HARP was started. In 1993, hardware started showing up. It was all subcontracted out. And by 1994, we were starting to assemble everything on site and, and making preparations to get operating. 
And in 1995, we had 18 towers and 18 transmitters ready to go. And HARP was actually built in three phases, as you'll see. And this was planned ahead of time. 18 towers, 18 transmitters, 48 towers, 48 transmitters, and then 180 towers and 180 transmitters. So this was the first phase. Well, as you would expect, whenever you do something for the first time, there's a learning curve and things didn't go so well. The transmitters were not reliable. We were burning up antenna matching units and our contractors had uh, gone away and some had overrun badly financially. So we took everything back in house. And so by about 1997, we had moved a transmitter from Alaska back to a light warehouse in Herndon, Virginia, and we completely redesigned the transmitter, completely. All the digital and analog RF, the driver amps, the uh, um, VME cage, all the software. We just redesigned the whole thing and brought it up to a state-of-the-art standard. The only thing we kept was the two uh, vacuum tube 4CX tower. 4CX 10,000D push-pull pair, the high-voltage power supply, the tuning coils, and the cabinet. That was all we, we, uh, all we could keep. And we demonstrated in that light warehouse with a load bay we called the chicken coop that we could put all kinds of different reactive loads and so on. We demonstrated to the government it all worked great. They said, fantastic. Now go modify the other 17 in Alaska to that same standard, which we did. Everything started working great. Well, one of the other failures we had were the antenna matching units on the towers. Those were failing. So we set about to design new antenna matching units. We had those ready to go, and I'll talk about that in a future slide. Okay, now we're looking good. <clears throat> we went back to Continental Electronics. They were duly impressed with what we had done. They manufactured 30 more transmitters for us to get the phase two. That's 18 plus 30 is 48 transmitters. We had the towers uh, outfitted with our new matching units. And so by, um, by 1999, we were up and running with 48 towers, 48 transmitters, 48 new antenna matching uh, unit towers, and everything is working great. And so we're really on a roll. So by 2003, and we were doing great science, our ERP topped out at about 60 megawatts at that point. Everything was working beautifully. So now 2003 comes along, we get full funding to build out to the 180 tower, 180 transmitter level. By 2007, we completed on time and under budget. How about that for a government contract? Don't hear that too often, but we did it. And we're up and running <clears throat> at full capability in 2007. Everything is going great until 2013. That was a bad year. The sequestration budget cuts hit. The Air Force Research Lab took a 20% cut. They nixed most all of their R&D projects and HARP was one of them. And we were told to shut down. They, they disconnected power. Everybody was laid off. The site went dark and cold. It was done. And we, we just couldn't believe it. The scientists were outraged. Well, then 2014 in here rolls along and DARPA comes up to the Air Force and says, hey, we got money. We got work to do here. Get that thing back up and running. After nine months of being totally shut down, we hired folks back. The site came up pretty quickly. DARPA worked for a year, did a lot of great work, and then they said, what do we do now? How do we fund this thing? Well, that's when the University of Alaska Fairbanks took over in 2015, and uh, they're now running it now, of course, 2017, that we're back in full operation, 2021. They got a big grant from the National Science Found Foundation, and 2022, uh, we just had um, a big research campaign and a big um, open house, so everything is back to normal and going great. Okay, where are we in Alaska? We are located in the town of Gakona, which is in the southeast part of Alaska, and we're there for three reasons. First off, it's U.S. territory, right? Obviously, it's a state. The second and most important reason is this is a northern latitude 
where within our antenna beam pointing angle, we get high probability of beaming into the auroral oval, which is a concentrated hollow ring of ionosphere caused by the Earth's magnetic field. This one around the South Pole as well, by the way. And thirdly, this was supposed to be an OTHB, an ANFPS 118 transmitting site. And the all-important environmental impact statement had been done, but they never built anything. So we could go and tweak that environmental impact statement and off we go. So that's where we're located. One problem though, is this is a permafrost area. So we have to mount everything into the crust of the permafrost for stability, which I'll be talking about. And I talked about the wide variety of ionosphere. Okay, this is what the HARP site looked like, an aerial view in 2003. This is the mid-level that I talked about. 48 towers, 48 transmitters right here. That's called the IRI, that ionospheric research in, in, instrument. There's other HF antennas here. Um, this is our operations center on the left and some diagnostic radars are in here. We have science pads at the site. There's an aircraft alert radar I'll talk about, another big HF site with uh, transmitters, receivers, and three science pads on the north road here. Uh, that's where our sounder is and some satellite stuff. That's another uh, HF pad, and that's a uh, radars pad. But then <clears throat> we go to 2007, the full build out, and now you see we've added another incoherent scatter radar here at UHF. We've expanded to the full 180 tower, 30 transmitter shelter building IRI array here. And that's a 40 acre transmit array. It's pretty big. <clears throat> okay, so we all know about the electromagnetic spectrum here. But what's interesting is that the HARP big HF transmitter only transmits from 2.6 2 to 10 megahertz. It was funny when I would call Agilent at the time and I would say, I need a signal generator that has ultra low phase noise and I only need it 2.6 to 10 megahertz. They would always say, oh, what is this clock for? And I'd say, no, it's not a clock. This is our carrier for a transmitter. And they'd laugh and they'd say, nobody builds transmitters at HF. I said, well, we are. <laughs> so it was always funny to get a reaction. But why are we only 2.6 to 10? The reason why our transmitters are limited to that range is the simple fact that when you're beaming vertically into the ionosphere, that vertical in incidence, the maximum usable frequency rarely goes above 10 megahertz. Now, if you're oblique sounding at low angles for long range communications or radar at HF, the MUF, that maximum usable frequency can go up to 30 megahertz. But when you're vertical incident, it never goes that high. So why build the transmitter to go higher than the ionosphere exists? If, if, we, if, we, if we're up at, say, 15 megahertz, there's no ionosphere. It's just going off into space. So that's the reason why we're only 2.6 to a 10. The point of this slide here is that one of the goals of HARP is using the ionosphere as a nonlinear active medium. The HF transmitter can generate secondary radiation sources at ULF, ELF, and VLF, visible light, and IR as a secondary emission from the ionosphere. And this is very use, useful. In other words, a simple experiment is we could be at say 6.8 megahertz, put a one kilohertz square wave, 100% AM. So our ERP, which tops out at five gigawatts, which I'll talk about, is going up and down at a kilohertz rate. We're stimulating and RF radiation out of the ionosphere at our modulation rate. So we're stimulating one kilohertz of useful coherent RF. In fact, we have swept from less than one hertz to 30 kilohertz at any rate you choose. And we can stimulate RF immediately over that entire 30 kilohertz range. So we're stimulating RF at our modulation rate and more complex waveforms are used certainly than a square wave. So the point here is that we have capability to sight over the entire spectrum here. And um, <clears throat> we can also produce radio wave propagation effects and new signal paths spanning the, pretty much the entire 
range and emerging high power radio technology for next generation DOD. So there's a lot of capability here to play with. Now, HARP is not the only ionospheric stimulation or the, the slang term is an ionospheric heater. It's not the only one out there. And this is a capabilities chart where what we're showing is effective radiated power on the vertical axis here in dBW and frequency capability on the horizontal line. HARP is the blue one up here. Notice how it's the most powerful and has the most frequency coverage possible of any of the known sites in the world. Now, we never transmit in the ham bands. We have an FCC experimental license. So we have allocated pieces of spectrum that we're allowed to roam in at will on a non-interference basis. But this is a capabilities chart. Now, there's another European site that's doing similar work, and that's called Trumpso, and it's located in Norway. Of course, they don't quite have the ERP that we have, but they have good, uh, good frequency range. Now, here we have Sura in Ukraine. I don't know the status of that site now with the conflict going on, but uh, Sura was a former Soviet un Union site that was used for ionospheric research, similar to what we're doing. And um, I was told that that site has one feature that we don't have. And I said, I can't believe it. And they said, well, it does. Folks that had been there and done some experimental work. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, oh, well, they only have like six or eight big high power transmitters. And they said, the feature is when you open the back of the transmitter, there's a bottle of vodka sitting in the back, ready for a little swig. We don't have that feature in our transmitters, I'm sad to say probably for, for the best. <laughs> right, that can be added. So then um, Arecibo, years back, this doesn't exist. They had a three fixed frequency operation at one time. Uh, the yellow is HARP back at that 48 transmitter level. And then we have high, high pass that was run by UCLA up in the Fairbanks area. And that has been torn down and that is gone. So HARP is not the only one. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit on the HARP IRI transmit array here, and let's see what, what we have. This is a HARP tower. Um, remember that permafrost that I talk, talked about? In order to anchor in, we have to use a device called a thermosiphon. This has 500 pounds uh, per square inch of gaseous CO2. And in the wintertime, those fins get chilled by 60, what well, by 30 to 60 below zero air and it li liquefies and drips down to the bottom and then comes back up as gas because it's going to be 32 down here. And that just sucks the heat out of the ground during the winter time and super freezes us into that stable uh, permafrost crust. In the summertime, it doesn't do a thing. So that's how we get stability in this permafrost area. The top eight feet, it thaws and freezes and is not stable at all. So that just works great. Kind of pipe pipeline technology there. We have a ground screen 15 feet off the ground. That's our ground plane. The towers are at ground. We have a set of high band fat dipoles here, trying to stay a quarter wave off the ground plane, high band matching unit. And then we have a low band fat bow tie dipole, again, towers at ground, and uh, a low band matching unit. The towers are about 75 feet high. Now, we actually have crossed dipoles because we want the experimenter to, to have the capability to use circular polarization, and you need orthogonal dipoles to do that. So this might be our north-south dipole, and then you've got east-west dipoles with their independent matching units coming in and out. Now notice how these are stacked. When we're on the low band, we have vacuum relays that open up the half dipoles here and float them. That dipole vanishes when we do that. And then when we want to use high, high band, <clears throat> high band, by the way, is 7 to 10 megahertz, and low band is 2.6 to 8.4. When we want to use high band, we close the vacuum relays to all the half dipoles, and we open them for the low band and float the half dipoles through a static drain choke, and they vanish. Dr. Brakal was the one who came up with this, and it works great. Okay, <clears throat> this is a view of the harp site just standing there. Here's that thermosiphon I talked about. There's the radiators. In the summertime, doesn't do a thing. In the wintertime, Easily, it's 30 to 40 below with no wind, 50 and 60 below often. 
in this part of Alaska. So that allows us to pull the heat out of the ground and remain anchored into the stable permafrost crust. Then you come, come up the tower, there's some uh, uh, local area network, fi fibers and uh, fire alarm stuff. And uh, <clears throat> then you come up and you can see this ground screen here. That's a 15 inch square of Aluma weld wires grounded to the towers, excellent ground plane. It's like a flat sheet of metal for HF. And then you can see the low band dipoles, east, west, north, south. The round cans are the matching units. They're fixed tuned. They just have vacuum relays to release those half dipoles when we don't want that band. And you can see the shelter buildings here we're gonna talk about. Um, there are uh, six transmitters per shelter building. They're custom built for our use. Okay, let's zoom in on a tower here. Um, <clears throat> here's the tower, that's a ground. So we have two feeds, that's one in five eighths coax, solid foam dielectric coax. We have uh, high band, low band switches. We have a east west feed and a north south feed. We have switches here. And so when we switch to the high band, these matching units are active here. These dipoles are floated and we go out the high, high band. When we want low band, we close the switch the other direction and we go to low band. These half dipoles are floated. The low band's active. There's a uh, matching unit, one for each dipole, obviously two because they're cross dipoles. This, they often use circular polarization. They can. This is all about phase, right? If you have cross dipoles and you feed them in quadrature phase, depend upon who's leading and who's lagging, you can get circular right or you can get circular left. Or if you put them both in phase, you can get linear um, or, or we can do elliptical. So this is just a choice for the experimenter. What electric field polarization do you want? So notice these boxes here. These boxes, these two boxes up here and the two boxes here, those are called even mode dump loads. The problem with our matching units was that we were getting mutual coupling in the array because the low band dipoles are so close to one another, such that the high band dipoles, which define the tower spacing, didn't give us grading lobes. So that pushed the low band dipoles really close. They're only 10 feet apart. So at the from about six megahertz down to 2.6, we get power from adjoining transmitters two and three towers away, shoving power back down into us. We just tune to whatever that SWR is. We call it an active impedance and it works great. So, but the problem is, is the SWR either better or worse from mutual coupled power, that's in the odd mode, meaning the voltage polarity on each side of the dipole is opposite, plus minus or minus plus. But what if that mutual coupled power is plus plus or minus minus, the same on both sides of the dipole? That's even mode power. It cannot radiate and it has to find a return to the transmitter. That's what was blowing up our antenna matching units. Once we figured that out, we designed a matching unit, which I show here, which has a dump port for even mode power if it's there. If it's not there, nothing comes out. Even mode power. If, and we realized we had even mode hotspots that would move around the array, many of, of them, dependent upon frequency and phase. What's that? Well, um, this is a, uh, a four port uh, hybrid transformer and it gives us a port so that if, if the phase or the polarity is plus plus or minus minus, it sends RF down and out that port. The odd mode cu coupled power still comes back as an SWR. You still see it getting better or worse. But we designed this in our lab. It works absolutely great. Notice that there's no ferrite. It's a four port hybrid transformer using special times coax wound on air. We're not allowed to use ferrite because if it saturates, it could create harmonic content. So anyway, and then the, uh, the relays that open the half dipoles when we go to the other band are down here, there's lumped L and C. These are all fixed tuned. Okay, here's a look at the transmitters in the shel shelter building here. And uh, you see three on the right, three on the, on the left. These are custom shelter buildings. There's armor plating in the walls. There's a single blower at the end. There's a floor plenum that shoves air up through the transmitters. There's a return plenum in the ceiling. 
as I said, 2.6 to 10. Now each transmitter has two outputs independently tuned. 10 kilowatts on the left side, 10 kilowatts on the right side. That's because the left is always the east-west dipole, the right is always the north-south. They have to be independently tuned, they're on the same frequency, and they share the same high voltage power supply in the middle. So that means on the left side, I've got two IMAC 4CX10,000D power grid tubes, grounded grid, cathode-driven push-pull for low second harmonic, on the left side, and then I've got two more on the right side. That's four IMAC 10,000 Ds per transmitter times 180. That's 720 IMAC 4CX 10,000 Ds. But boy, are they rugged. Okay, so look at our, uh, we have an automatic antenna tuner here. We can tune to a VSWRs less than five to one. We have graceful degradation above five to one. Uh, these are linear amps. We have 200 kilohertz of bandwidth and up to 500 kilohertz. That's a huge chunk of bandwidth at HF. Look at the low harmonic and spurious here. And these transmitters can do a CW carrier. They can do AM. They can do FM. They can do phase mod. They can pulse with user-defined shaped rise and fall times, and they can do it all at the same time. They're RF, arbitrary, waveform, high-power generators, ultra-low phase noise, ultra-precise, six in a shelter building. This is what the op center looks like here. This is on site. This is where the operator sits. We have beautiful GUI software. He controls our power plant here on the right. Spectrum monitors to look at our spectrum. Uh, shelter environmental here and aircraft alert rate, radar here. Okay, now how do we keep track of 180 transmitters? That's huge, that's so many. So we've developed this display here. It's geometrically correct. If you were a bird over top of the, the array, this is, the same orientation of towers and the same orientation of transmitters. There's one transmitter per tower all the time. And we have a row column. We have 12 rows, 12 rows by 15 columns. So that one is 15 column row one, that's transmitter 1501. Up and down is east west, to the right and left is north south. Green is forward power and blue is reflected power. Rather than having two independent bar graphs, we just form a box. So the blue is the reflected power. And notice how it's improved in the center. These three A's here, those are transmitters that are offline. That rarely ha happens. You can click your mouse on any one of these transmitters, get the control panel. You can see all that's going on. Okay, we have the capability to see our radiation pattern in real time. We have current monitors on the balanced output of every antenna matching unit. And we bring those samples back into the shelter building with 3 8 inch coax lines, do an A to D, bring those real-time current on the dipole samples back to the op center over our fiber LAN. And we use a NEC4 model, and we can calculate our radiation pattern. The system has the capability to do two-frequency operation. So I'm showing a two-frequency operation here. There's some random number of transmitters on frequency one. That's the green. That would be the lowest ERP. So let's see, that would be this guy here, 2.573 megawatts, 4.5 megahertz. This is the rest of the transmitters. I don't know what the pattern chosen was, but that's obviously at 6.8 megahertz at 4.702. So we can see side lobes, we can see pointing angles. How cool is that? We can see our radiation pattern in real time and the government flew pattern cuts at 10,000 feet and verified the accuracy of this technique. They were duly impressed. Now, we can't get enough power to run all these transmitters from the local power grid. We get power from Valdez, Alaska. That's 160 miles away. It's three phase power. It's barely good for a megawatt. And the frequency and the phase balance is awful. So we have our own power plant here. We have, we have five 20-cylinder EMD diesel generators, all compressed air start, auto sync. We need four of them online to run all the transmitters. Typically, the offices and our diagnostic shelter buildings are run with power off the street. And we just turn on the power plant for the big transmitters. We have to have four of the five generators online to run all the transmitters. So we have one spare. So the key point here <clears throat> is that when the array is a CW carrier and everything's properly tuned with four generators, 
we consume 500 gallons per hour of diesel fuel. That's a lot. But, you know, but, but we, we have 15,000 gallons on site in tanks. Okay, we, we, the FAA came, came to us and the FAA said, can you guarantee us that you will never be a hazard to flight? That you're not going to blank out the front end of a radio when a pilot gets a call in the VHF band? That you're not going to disturb a VOR and momentarily tell them to, to, to do something weird? So you can never guarantee something 100%. So what I did was I got a 60 kilowatt S-band for Runo radar here, tilted the antenna up and used that uh, with a PC plugged into the shipboard terminal through a firm that gave us software that would emulate the terminal. So we, we've got about a, about a 50 mile range. We can track planes. Then I put a TCAS, you know, planes have T, TCAS as a collision avoidance active transponder interrogator. So we got a high powered TCAS, mounted it on this plate and brought that in. And so we're pinging transponders, but we're not a transponder. They don't ping us. So we, we could get hemispherical coverage of mode S transponders with, they give us what their altitude is. That's part of the response. We get an asthma through DFing that's built, built in. And then we can also track them here. Then I added ADSB which is the new GPS beacon. So we get three tracks on planes from 500 feet to 55,000 feet. And whenever a plane gets within five miles of the site, we sound off a weird wave file, like a ding, like a gong or something. And the system automatically stops transmitting till that target or targets get more than five miles away. The FAA loved, loved it. So we just don't transmit when anybody's within five miles, we can never be blamed. Okay, here we are installing some transmitters. Shows a transmitter being mounted. There's our power transformer. There's a transmitter going up against the, the wall. You can see an output tuning coil here. There's a servo motor at the bottom. <clears throat> this is the side of a transmitter. That's an output antenna tuning coil. It's a L net network. This is the plate tuning coil for the two tubes and the push-pull pair. Very rugged, very reliable. Here we are mounting transmitters in the shelter building. We did this all ourselves. You can see them, you can see the high voltage power supply here. Remember it's 10 kilowatts on one side, that's the east-west on his tower. 10 kilowatts on that side, that's the north-south and they share a high voltage power su supply here to a pretty large extent. Notice there's not much front panel, everything's done over a laptop. Now, one of the things we pioneered here, <clears throat> and I'm just about to wrap this up, the scientists naturally wanted transmitters that were effectively calibrated like a piece of test equipment. They want precision power, precision phase, low phase noise. They want pure, pure signals coming out. So in addition to being linear amplifiers, I pioneered a technique where I'm plus 10 dBm RF drive on top, and my phase control is plus 10 dBm out to have the active phase lock loop. So I, I borrow those ports and I use a network analyzer and I can sweep the entire transmitter. And I can, uh, I can by adjusting stepper motor offsets that are gonna remain as a cal for that one transmitter, I can put in stepper motor offsets for all the tuning and I can give them a perfect band pass, per perfect phase, perfect gain. And then, um, I also got precision watt meters and also do a cal against precision watt meters. Now we do it every 500 kilohertz and we do a spline fit to interpolate in between those points for both stepper motor offsets for perfect tuning and for power cal. And it works beautifully. It's very close to a piece of Agilent test equipment. It just really worked great. Continental had never seen that. Okay, that's what a finished HARP transmitter shelter building looks like. These are QA sheets. Remember, we have a cooling supply plenum in the floor, pushes cooling air up to the transmitters, those black hoses, that's hot air coming through the solid state drivers and the power amps, goes into a return plenum in the ceiling. We automatically mix warm air with outside cold air to maintain a plus 58 Fahrenheit inlet air temp. Works great. There's a shot of the harp site from high altitude, a 40 acre transmit array here. There are 30 shel shelter buildings, six transmitters per building here. And they're spaced under the array so that the, the coax feed lines up each tower 
from every 10 kilowatt side are the same electrical length. That way it's a constant. I don't care about it. And <clears throat> you can again see our operations center. That's Mount Sanford. That's about 35 miles away. That's not Den Denali. That's way too far away. That's in the Wrangell St. Elias Mountains. You can see the ionospheric sounder here. You folks know about the auroral oval. Won't comment about that, but that's just a quick slide on the auroral oval. That's about 40% of the time it's within our view, and that's very useful to us. There's a picture of what an aurora looks like over top of the harp site. That's our optics trailer there. And that's, in effect, that's painting out the auroral oval that's sitting over top of us, practically. Um, this is <clears throat> an explanation of how we can use our modulation rate at high power HF to stimulate RF out of the ionosphere at our modulation rate. And it works great. Um, <clears throat> there's a mining school up north of the site in Delta Junction, Alaska. We use it as a target of opportunity. We generate ELF, and then we hand-walked over top of this uh, mining school mine tunnel here to see if we could see it. And sure, sure enough, we can image the tunnel using the pulsed ELF that we generate in a radar mode. So again, the application here is HARP generates the ELF, the skin depth of soil and salt water is very deep at these ELF, ULF rates. We're trying to perfect the technology for ground penetrating ra radars and ocean penetrating radars for uh, caves, tunnels, bunkers on land, submarines, ocean floor mapping, and so on. But again, the key here is we're generating that ELF, ULF ourselves with high power HF, RF. And <clears throat> Just about done here. So this is this is a picture of artificial aurora, if you will. This is HARP transmitting just a carrier, just a carrier. And I could never see this with my bare eye, but this is from a high sensitivity CCD camera. And <clears throat> some folks said they could see this with their bare eye. Why that structure is there, I don't know, but that's just the HARP beam not being moved, just sort of stimulating light out of the ionosphere. It's amazing what you can do with a five gigawatt ERP, but it doesn't hurt anything, no effect on weather, no conspiracy theories are, are, are true. Now, this is um, some other ex experiments. Uh, we can create wave ducts. We can create uh, disturbances to satellite comms, and the satellite folks love it because they can then test their software to take those scintillations back out. We can do it on demand. Uh, we can also create field-aligned ir irregularities. That's a mirror in the sky for VHF. It works very, very well. Easy to do. This is a view of the HARP site at minus 40F. Look how huge this is. And look how perfectly aligned it is. This is called hoar frost. And uh, that was just standing at the op center one day. And that's a close-up view of the HARP site. You can again see the high band matching units, the low band matching units. Uh, you can see the ground screen here. You can walk under the ground screen, drive under the ground screen. The electric fields are very low. It's it's not it's not a bad thing, but you know we don't go hang out there. But it's an extremely effective ground plane and shield. Pardon? How far away are, is personnel? The operation center is one third a mile away. We have a fence and we just have just an arbitrary rule. Just don't go inside the fence of the array, but you can get much closer and it's, it's safe. And that's a quick run through with a harp site. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker. I don't know. I think we have time for one, one or two questions. Just give me a chance to give a the online people to ask questions. We apologize, we didn't give a chance to us in the previous talk. So right now, please go ahead, Ray. Uh, we did have a question here from Jim. Uh, he said, didn't understand how your power gets to the mine. I'm not sure if they're talking about the RF power or the electrical power, but how do you, how do you transmit or how do you get the power to it? To, to the mine. <clears throat> I think what he's, whoops, uh-oh, I, I lost, I can't, can't get back to my, oh, there it is. Okay, so basically what's happening is HARP is beaming virtually, vertically up, and we're putting an amplitude modulation on it, 
and repulsing our HF, car HF carriers. So let's just say, for example, the RF is at a kilohertz. So we have a we have 100% AM at one kilohertz and we're pulsing that carrier and it might be, let's say, 6.8 megahertz. So that's going up to the ionosphere and stimulating in a pulsed way one kilohertz of RF out of the ionosphere. And that one kilo, kilohertz of RF radiates back down and it goes through the rock into the mine and then reflects out. And then what we did in this experiment was we had a receiver that people held in their hands and they walked over top of the mine and got the incident wave and the reflected wave, did some signal processing on it. And it was that one kilohertz stimulated RF pulsed out of the ionosphere by us pulsing our HF carrier. What? Yeah, well, they can, they can, they, they know where they are at any moment in time and they can get the incident wave and then there's time delay and then the other pulse comes out and then they can walk and they can triangulate and get that, get that result there. This was done when we were only running 60 megawatts, by the way. This was when we were at 48 transmitters. So it's better now. Okay, I just was wondering, how do you keep bugs out of the cooling system plenum and that in the summertime, you know, a couple of weeks of summer that you have, have having uh, uh, some experience with an FM broadcast station using those same transmitting tube, tubes and that, uh, it, I know it can be, uh, uh, can be a problem. <laughs> well, you know, that is an excellent question and I can answer that absolutely for you. So these shelter buildings were custom made for us. These, these are not just random trailers. So the end that I didn't have a picture of where the air is brought in, there are big lou louvers. But the interesting thing is that we were told, and it appears to be true, that if that air intake, if the minimum height is more than so many feet above the ground, the bugs don't fly that high. So I would say it's probably up around maybe five feet, six feet up, I don't know. But so that air in, intake, it's, ta it's ta tapered up and it's high enough above the ground where the bugs don't fly that high. So it goes in through the, the air is sucked in through the louvers and then there is filter media. You do have, fil but I don't recall bugs filling up the filter media and there are a lot of bugs in Alaska. As you know, that's a common problem. But that height thing really worked. Yep. Okay, uh, one more question. Okay, please go ahead online. Another one from online. Uh, how much uh, one kilohertz power do you think actually gets into the mine? Well, you know, I would only be guessing. Um, the amount of, the amplitude of the stimulated ELF is very, very small. This is not strong. It's enough for a receiver to work with but I don't have an answer for you because I would just be guessing and I don't want to guess. And it varies wildly day to day and hour to hour, um, but it, it's a very small amount of power, but it's useful. And that's the best answer I can give. Thank you very much.